Well, I'm excited to talk to you tonight about, tonight about the alligator farm. Um, we have lots of people in here that take pictures of the alligator farm, many of whom I think are probably better than I am, but I've probably made more mistakes than any of them. So what I'm trying to do now is just, as I go through this, give you some hints on how to avoid some of the mistakes and uh, maybe a pearl of wisdom or two on how to uh, get a better shot. First of all, what we're gonna talk about tonight Okay, my PowerPoint's locked up. I can hear you. You guys can hear me? Okay. My PowerPoint is not working for some reason. Okay, hang on a second, guys. Okay. Let's talk about what we're going to learn tonight. We're going to we're going to find out about what's going on at the alligator farm from the calendar perspective. What happens at different times of the year, uh, and we'll talk about the different entrance costs and what they are and the options you have. And then we're going to talk a little bit different in terms of the approach. Instead of saying here's everything you need, here's what you need to take, here's how to prepare, we're going to go shot by shot. So we're going to say, okay, how do I get a bird on a branch with bokeh? What do I need to do to prepare and how to take that? What do I need to do with post-processing? So we're going to go shot by shot and we'll talk about what you need to do each of those and how you get the shots for those. Um, we'll go through all these different um, birds, shots, birds in a nest. A birds in flight is always the hardest and we'll do a, a quite a bit of information there. But uh, then we'll talk about other shots that you can take also. General park information, what's going on now? I was just there last Friday and there were lots of great egrets, the wood storks were there and uh, lots of the spoonbills. Uh, so those stalls start coming in in late, to late February. And then by early uh, March, the great egrets and storks really come in and, they'll, and everybody's building nests right now. So the, the birds that are there, they're building the nests and they're flying back and forth know uh, that maybe a few of the spoonbills have a nest built and, and I don't didn't see any eggs, but but there might be, but uh, soon. Mid-March, most of the great egrets start incubating eggs. Um, that will, you know, start laying those pretty soon. There's lots of uh, displays and mating going on at this point. Uh, and then in late March, the egrets start to ha um, hatch out. Most of the wood storks are already incubating their eggs and uh, the snowies come in in late March and they don't waste any time uh, laying eggs. Early April, word storks start hatching, the great egrets hitch, uh, it, chicks are getting to a good size and the snowies, little blues, tricolors are laying eggs. Cattery egrets start showing up, they're the last ones that get there, but um, they're also, I think, one of the more interesting ones to photograph. Mid-April, uh, mid um, green herons start to nest, not in the rookery, they'll be out in the other areas. I'll show you a map of the where things are in the, in the alligator farm and you'll see where the rookery is. They'll be outside of that. Um, by late April, the rookery is mass chaos. That's really the best time I think to go mid to late April because everything will be there. Um, every Pretty much everybody will start to have eggs and or in some cases they'll there really be lots of chicks. Um, and then May, um, They'll, they'll start to um, hatch out there. And then the, the, by mid-May, the great egrets uh, chicks are big. There's lots of them. There's lots of feeding going on. And then mid-May and early June, the fledging starts uh, in mid-June. And then there's chicks everywhere. And you'll start to see them fly off. So uh, that's kind of the overall. Uh, by August, everything's pretty much done. You have several different interest costs and options. One, the one I'm gonna talk about really the most, you can read the others, is really the photography pass. It's $149 a year, basically $150 a year, but it gives you some things that you can do that you can't do with any other ticket. You can get in early, 8 a.m., and I'll show you those dates in a minute, uh, 
to the park. You have to be there right on time. They open the door, they let you in, and they shut it. You also can stay late. You can stay past the sh uh, an hour past closing time. And that's kind of nice if you want to go down there and just get some evening nice um, light shots. There's a, a photographer's deck that you can get on. I personally have never been on it. I think it's kind of out of the way there. I don't, I don't really think it adds much to it, to what you see. Well, yeah, I know. I mean, I've I've seen I've seen where it is. I actually walked out on it once, but I've never shot from there. Is what I'm saying. I don't. Uh, maybe maybe there's something to, to shoot from there, but I I've always been out of it. Yeah. And then um, you have five entries in the photo park uh, in the photo contest. So every year the alligator farm sponsors a photo contest and you submit up to five photos. I believe they have to be in raw. I don't think you can do any post-processing on them. They have to be the raw photos that you submit. And then every year they pick winners and they post them on their brochures and flyers. Um, and you get discounts for your immediate party. So if you've got people going in, you get a 10% discount. The extended hours start March 1st and go through July 2nd. Uh, there are some different rules. I'm not going to really read these too much for you. Uh, I just so everybody knows, I will post this presentation on Facebook and on the on the website. So if you have any need to see it, it'll be there. So you can go grab things and take a look at it. So you don't have to really look here. But on the right hand side, you can see all the birds that are there. I have you know, all those birds are there, but this year I saw a nest that I've never seen before. There's an onhinga nesting in there. And he's the female was up there doing all sorts of dancing, trying to bring in the mate, but it was really interesting. But there's a there's an hanging nest right there in the middle of the alligator rookery. As you come in, for those of you who haven't been there, most of us know this by heart, but you come in, you go off to the right and back in the back, there is a big boardwalk. And that boardwalk is where you get the shots. There's trees on either side of that boardwalk. And in some cases you can be five feet from a nest or, or in other cases you can be 50 feet from a nest, depending on what you do. If you take a look at this, um, what you can see here is the boardwalk from the uh, Google Maps view. Yes, ma'am. And you can take a look at uh, it. You know, and you can, uh, uh, on the phone, if you don't mind going on mute, please. Um, on, on the boardwalk, you can see on the right and left-hand side, uh, as you walk out, those are where the most close nests are. At the far end, you'll see a little platform there. That platform is where you see a, a lot of the different trees, and you'll see water out with reflections and things, and, and there'll be birds farther out in those trees. But that is basic the overview of where you're going to go take the pictures. All right. Let's start by looking at the different shots we're gonna take. The first one we're gonna do is a bird on a branch. And we're gonna do a bird on a branch with bokeh. Now, what are you gonna to need to do this? You're gonna need your DLSR or a mirrorless and a fairly long lens because it takes a longer lens to get your bokeh when you get up close to the birds. And probably in the 300 to 600 millimeter range in a 35 millimeter equivalent. So if, you, if you're shooting a crop lens or a micro four thirds, that's gonna be less than that. I would also recommend that you take, uh, find yourself a quick depth of field calculator. I use photo pills. And what you can do there is take a look and say, I'm gonna be shooting at 400 millimeters or 300 millimeters, whatever it is. I'm gonna use this F stop and it's gonna be at this distance and it will give you your depth of field in inches. Now, one of the things that you don't want to do is sit there and do depth of field on every shot. All you're really going to try to do with this is as you're getting prepared to go to the alligator farm, take some time and take a look at where you think you're going to be taking your shots at the shutter speeds, f-stops, and everything. And then just look at where your depth of field is. What you're really trying to do is give yourself a sense of, ah, I'm really going to I'm, I really don't have much, I have a lot, too much depth of field and I want to narrow it down. So I'm going to have to try to stop down more or whatever, but at least get an idea of what you're going to have. And when you go out there, oop, hang on a second. 
so when you go out there, you'll you'll understand what that is or what what your limitations are, and then um, you also need to know how to set shoot your camera in, in uh, manual mode. What do you want to do to set up? You want to set it up with your f-stop as low as you can. Because if you want narrow depth of field, the lower your ref stop, the, the, the more shallow your depth of field. You want to set your ISO to auto, and then you want to uh, get to the bird as close, close as you can. Ideally, if you're going to get a good shot, you get the bird in the shade because the shade will not blow out all your highlights and everything. It'll give you a better saturation in your color. And then also you want to do, get it with a few branches in the foreground or in the way. Um, we'll talk with, with sunlight, um, we'll look for a blue sky background. If you're taking a picture on a bird on a branch with sunlight, you want to look for a blue sky background and front lighting if possible. Uh, just focus on the bird, do a quick read it off the lens and see where I am and say, okay, um, let me do um, what my depth of field is. Just quick calculation, you want 8 to 12 inches if you're doing a bird on a branch with focus, something like that. You also need to understand your shutter speed. If you're shooting at 400 millimeters and a 35 millimeter equivalent, the standard is you need to shoot at what, at least one 400th of a second. So you always want to be, uh, if you're shooting at that length, you want always want to have your shutter speed faster than your millimeter length, right? So if you're shooting at 420, like I get a lot of those, I need at least a 500th of a second to keep from getting shake in my lens because it's hard to hold it, hand hold it that way. If you have image stabilization, turn it on because you can get, uh, uh, you can shoot a little bit slower that way and still not get the shake or it will at least help you. And then the last thing you do is if you have any kind of subject recognition or focus like that, turn it on. You want to focus on the eye. All right, what to look for. The bird on the branch, shadows, little foreground, taking shot. If you have some patience, watch what the bird's doing. Uh, sometimes you'll, you'll see it do one thing then another, but uh, just you know, be careful about taking too many shots of one and, and then taking a look at it. So oh, should take another shot. Just take your time and take it either. Move around to get, get your foreground clutter out of the way. Take single shots. Don't turn off your burst mode. You don't want to take single, you don't want to take burst shots here at this point. Uh, and once you have a good shot, don't fill up your camera because you'll miss some another good shot. So just you know, make sure you get the good shot and then move on. It's it's in spot metering in the center. Is it, the question was, how do you meter this? And I tend to try to use the spot meter in the center, okay? And make sure you focus in the sweet spot. You don't wanna have crops so tight that you don't have any um, chance to, to straighten the horizon or crop some other things, but you wanna make sure that you can uh, take enough of it, but you don't want it so big that you have to crop it too much. All right, let's talk about post-processing for a minute. Rather than bore you with my normal monologue, I'm actually gonna go into Lightroom for a minute and actually show you how to do this. Sorry, I should have had this open. What I want to start with is um, the bird on a branch, the cattle egret that I actually had pretty good success with in some uh, different um, in some different contests. Okay, now in this way, All right? Went too far. Okay, so here's here's the starting image. As you can see, there's some foreground clutter. There's some um, different things across the bird, and then here is the final image. 
where I've cleaned it up and I've um, gotten rid of that foreground clutter. I've softened out the background and, and uh, hit down the, some of the high spots. Now, one of the things you need to do is if you're going to be entering these photos in contests, you need to take a look and say, what are the restrictions on how I edit that? Because it could be that you're not allowed to take out foreground clutter or you're not rate, or, uh, allowed to do some of these things if you're going to enter in a nature documentary. So make sure before you start this, you know what you're going to do. So what we're going to do right here, we're going to start by, we're just going to say, okay, we're just going to crop this for a minute. Easy enough. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm just going to show you the basics and then you can kind of go from there. All right. Now, as you can see, I've got a lot of foreground clutter here, these little um, pieces of vine. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into Lightroom. I mean, Photoshop, sorry, I'm in Lightroom. And I'm going to get rid of that foreground clutter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do the lasso selection and I'm going to use the content aware fill in order to do this. Now there's a couple of tips on when you're doing this uh, uh, to make sure that you don't, that, that it works the best you can. And that's what I want to show you now. So the first thing you really want to do is zoom in on this. So as you can see, I've got this little thing right here. One of the things that's important is if you're going to take this stuff out, you select it as tight as you can. Don't go wide around this. Also, don't cross boundaries on colors. So you see right there, I stop at the bird. Because if you go across that, you're going to get some different um, results that you don't want. So you do a fill, content aware, and boom, that goes away. Next thing I want to do is this one right here. Same thing over and over. It takes time to get this out of there, but when you're done, you've got a really nice um, full picture. Now, I, I can take this whole thing out a little bit of time. I'm going to do it fast. Just it's not going to get the perfect result, but but you want to do this is just a little bit at a time on on one color. Even down here on this leg. I don't want to cross the color on the legs because I've done I did that. So you want to take that one out. It's important to select it as, as tight as you can and keep it tight. And as you can see now that as you start to look at this stuff, um, it really does a pretty nice job of filling that in. It's hard to see where, where it even was to begin with, right? Um, then what then the other thing you want to do is as you're doing this over here. Just if uh, what I do is I, I just do a fill. There's two different ways to do it. You can do a content aware fill, or you can do a fill with the content aware option. I do the fill with the con correct. Yeah, I do the fill and the content aware pops up, and I just turn it on. So you, you can get rid of all this stuff pretty quick, it goes away, right? Uh, and then um, I'll just I'm not going to do this completely. I'm just going to do this last little bit here and get rid of that. The next thing you know, you've got a pretty cleaned up picture. All right. So let's go ahead and save this. Go back to Lightroom. We're going to do that. Actually, that's okay. Where is my? Why is this? All right. Now, one of the things you, we're going to see here, like we have a white spot up here, right? Lightroom has added quite a few new little adjustment brushes, right? I use that you can do subject detection, you can do all sorts of other things. But um, let me just use the brush right now. I'm just gonna use the brush here. And I'm just gonna do the select this and I'm gonna select it with the auto mask. And I'm just gonna drop the exposure a little bit. 
just to knock that down a little bit. Next, I'm going to do I'm going to do a another. I'm going to create another mask, and I'm going to do a subject select. And what this is going to do is it will actually highlight the bird. It does a it does a really nice job of finding the bird and highlighting it, as you can see there. I want to invert that, and I want to go ahead and I want to take and um, lower my sharpness. So I get I take a little bit of that, get some of that stuff out a little bit out of, out of focus. And then the last thing I want to do is I as I go through here, I want to say okay, I want to do my regular um, save this. I'm going fast, so hope, uh, hopefully you're able to get some of this. So I'll just hit my normal adjustment. One of the things that you can find, especially if you're getting birds in the shadows, is it can oversaturate. So you want to make sure that as you're looking at this, you don't oversaturate your images um, because then they can look a little funky, uh, but you can do that. I always add just a little bit of post crop vin vignetting, just a little bit to make the focus on the bird. And that's basically uh, a few things that you can do pretty quick to get you know a fairly nice looking bird. Any questions on that before I go on? If you have any questions, especially, you know, if it's your first time out and you're doing some different things and you want to get some um, different ideas about how you can do things different, post it on Facebook. The, the group here is really good about giving you feedback on what you did or didn't do or how you can improve your shots. So don't be afraid to do that. That'll, that'll be, they're very helpful. Good question. Go ahead online. Yeah. So as you're while you're while you're lining up the camera for the shot, are you utilizing the roll of thirds uh, and then uh, cropping it in tighter once you get to the uh, to the editing aspect of the picture? Rachel, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Oh, okay. Okay, my daughter is asking me a question. Sorry, I'm lying. Um, so let's look for a bird on the branch, right? One of the things that's important is when you're taking these shots. Um, you want to take a look at, at the birds on a branch, see if you can get a nice blue background. And I'll show you what we're going to do with that in a minute. But if, you, if there's breeze and mating plumage, try to get that out there. If there are multiple birds, remember the rule of odds, because the rule of odds and the rule of thirds come into play as you're, as you're doing these things. From a rule of odds, you want to get an odd number of subjects, right? And so ones, threes are much more pleasing to the eye than twos and fours. So take a look at that. Uh, also, if you're shooting the bird in the sunlight, take and, and dial down your exposure a stop or two. Uh, even though you might be metering on the bird, it's still going to blow it out. So, you know, drop, uh, do a little bit of uh, dialing back on your exposure compensation. And then try if you can get a frontal or a, a portrait, or not, um, not a portrait, a, a frontal or a profile shot if you can. Bird butts are not usually the best, but. I've got lots of them on my photos. We'll try to stay away from that. Um, all right. Post-processing. Again, read the um, read the rule of third or read the things. Uh, if if you're doing uh, if you're doing cropping or shots, uh, try to do the you know the, the rule of thirds. So you put your subject in one of the third quadrants, the lower third, upper third, uh, right or left, try to do a rule of thirds. And then uh, again, use your Lightroom brush to take down hot spots or whatever and do a little bit of post crop um, vignetting. Now, one of the nice things about getting this kind of a shot, right? Is once you do this and you've got that blue there, you could do sky replacement and add some different um, character to this. So let me go over here again. I'm gonna start with this guy, right? There's the, there's the shot I have. What I typically do in this kind of a thing is I'll go in and I'll go in to edit in Photoshop again. And then when I do this, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can use a sky replacement. I typically tend to use a color select. So as I'm going into here, I'm gonna select the blue, 
and it gives me a little bit better control over what I select than this than this guy. All right, so I need to go. All right, so I go. Oh, I'm in light. Go back. Photoshop for some reason is giving me all these different things. Okay, so here I am. Right, I'm going to do a select color range, and then I'm going to put the dropper here on the blue. Right, and then your fuzziness that you can give either selects it tighter or looser. I like to get a little bit tighter in this particular case because it'll take some of the blue out and I say, okay. And then um, in this particular case, I'm gonna do a couple things. First, I'm gonna show you how to do, uh, I'll do, do select, guy select in a minute. But what I wanna do here is I wanna do a fill. And instead of content aware, I'm gonna do white and say, okay. And what it's gonna allow you to do is do a high key photo. So as you can see here, we, we've got this uh, high key photo uh, and we can send it back to uh, Lightroom and then do some adjustments. I've got one over there. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. Or we can do the same thing, only we can do a fill. Uh, do a fill with black. If you want to do really make that bird pop, a white bird here and make it pop. Or I can deselect and then do an edit sky replacement and and add some different uh, character here with this with the sky replacement yes yes I have an existing image with that in it let me do that one more time get it right All right. And there you go. So you can get you can do all sorts of different things. That blue really gives you some options, right? So one of the things to know though is I go back over here to Lightroom, right? And one of the things is I if I have a black or a white, the blue sends tends to end up here in the in these fringes. So what you'll need to do is Select the brush here. And just the, take all the areas that the blue is in and then just take the saturation down. So that's all you really need to do is just take, uh, where is it? Here it is, you just take the saturation all the way down in there and then goes to black and white. And you don't have those different uh, blues highlighting up in there. And so you can do a lot of work with these different images with the blue background. It gives you some really options, some good options when you're doing this type of thing. Any questions on that? Yeah, with the, um, with the background, is that auto-populated that sky or can you, uh, can you choose other imagery for the background? The question, on, the question on the phone is, if I want a different sky background, can I choose that? The answer is yes. It comes with several stock sky backgrounds already, but you can load your own images in. So if you have a particular sky that you really like, you can load that in and you can use that for the sky replacement. One of the things is, especially if you're doing something like a Milky Way, right? And, and you need to, you don't like the Milky Way you have or whatever, you can fake it, put the good one in. <laughs> So there's lots of options with the sky replacement. Thank you. Hmm? All right, uh, wrong one, where am I? I thought I, all right, we have to maybe go back to where we were. There we are. 
Okay, so we did, we tried the high key, we tried black browns, and you, you can do other backgrounds. So um, like, the, like the question on the phone was, what can I do? You can pretty much use any background you wanted to use in there. That's what that blue background gives you a chance to do. All right, let's talk birds on a nest. Jerry, could I, could I ask you to just back up for a second there, please? It's Helen. Hi, Helen. We're at it. Hi. Yeah, okay. just relative to what Rachel was talking about, about uh, rule of thirds, it, relative to that particular bird, um, did you, when you were trying to figure out, all right, how am I going to center this? I'm going to use, am I going to use rule of thirds? Am I going to center it right more or less in the center with a little bit more on the right than the left? How did you decide what you were going to do? So the question on the phone is, if I want to set this up, and am I looking at rule of thirds? Am I centering it? How did I determine this? I just thought that looked the best. <laughs> okay. <thank you. laughs> so I, 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 what I did do, Helen, is I tried to, you know, if you look at the really where the center of this image is, it's really kind of where the branch goes over the bird, right? And so if I go too far down and to get that more in the bottom uh, left thirds, I'm going to lose some of the image that I, uh, I'm gonna have too much space on the top or too tight. So what I did is I tried to balance it a little bit. So it's almost between the lower third and the middle. This is what I tried to do there. Very good, perfect, thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's talk about birds on a nest. If you're taking a nest bird, you're gonna need a medium to a long lens because the birds on the nest are much closer to you than the birds on the tall branches, high in the branches or and in many cases, uh, they're a little bit farther away when you're taking them even back in the shade. So if you have a 35 millimeter equivalent of a 200, 600, that's pretty good. Uh, a knowledge of where the nests are going to be. Now, one of the things that I'll show you here is I've actually, I chronicled last year, I chronicled the nest from the mating in the bird nest all the way through the chicks. And so as you do that, one of the things you're going to want to do is you want to be able to say, okay, I want to know how many nests I'm going to watch. I just watched one and I got lucky. It, it went through that the entire year, but this year I'm going to, I'm going to try to monitor three or four. And to do that, I want to know where they are. I might want to take some notes and, and just make some notes on where they are. So I can go back to them and say, Oh, I remember where that is now. Um, as you're walking down the boardwalk, one of the things that you're going to want to do I think it's here, uh, yeah, from the setup. But one of the things you don't want to do is just stop and take pictures, 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 and then go another five feet, take more pictures, more pictures. I, I encourage you to walk the whole boardwalk and see where the nests are, because what you'll find is at different points of the day, the light changes and, and how much you're going to be light where on which nest. And so you want to try to get the sweet spot on the light. So walk it first, figure, figure out which rest you want to take pictures of them and go back and take them, but do that. Um, like I said, the other thing you want to do is there's the documenting nests throughout the year. Um, you need to figure out how to tell which one it is. I just do this. I go, this is nest number two and take a picture of my fingers too. And then I make a note, say that's it. And then four or whatever. The hard part is when I have to do six. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and if you have, again, uh, try to focus on the bird's eye. That's really where you want to be. Same kind of thing. You want to take a picture of the, of the nest in the shade. You will not have as much luck getting a nest with bokeh just because they're in the, in the trees. There's lots of different tangles and stuff around them. Um, and try to get an, if you're going for the eggs, try to get an angle where you can see the eggs. So you might have to hold the camera up a little bit to get it, but if you can, you do want to see the eggs so you can get them. Um, if you can, if they're coming on and off the nest, see if you can get the pair together because they'll, 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 we'll switch off throughout the day. Uh, and then you may need a little bit more depth of field if you want to get the nest and everything in focus. So you, even though you might not get the bokeh you want, you want to make sure you get everything in focus you need. Watch your ISO and shutter speed. <clears throat> One of the things that can happen here is if you get if you get the shutter speed 
too fast and the ISO too high, you can get noise. It's easy to get noise in these when you're really back in the shade in those. So watch out, watch out for that. I use Denoise AI by Topaz. Uh, I don't know if anybody else uses that or has any other tool that they use, but that's the one that I use. You need to be careful as you're doing noise reduction that you don't go too far and get that plastic look, right? Um, so let me just go over here for a minute to back to Lightroom. I've got this image here. Uh, I'm not gonna show you the things I did before because I don't wanna be redundant, but there are a few things that are interesting about this. Um, there's a new tool that Lightroom has. It's a content aware healing brush. So if you look in this particular picture, it's a little bit of noise, I haven't denoised that one. There's this little annoying white piece of hair right across this guy's forehead. One of the nice things about this new <clears throat> uh, healing brush is this content aware thing right here. And what you do is you just dial this down as close as you can get, as small as you can get it, and just run it right along there. And that just disappears. So, Lightroom, Lightroom has this new, these new tools from the brush, from the healing brushes, from the content aware thing, from the subject selections that if you haven't updated and tried it lately, you really should. I've, I find myself going to Photoshop less and less because I can do more in Lightroom. Uh, but, you know, give that a shot. There's some different things you can do there. Uh, but in this particular case, as you can see, I got quite a bit of noise in this one because of that. And if I do just to show you what um, Topaz Denoise can do. One thing I will tell you, it's not super, this is not super fast. So, okay. Now I'm just gonna apply this just so you can see the difference. I'm just taking a quick, I already had this one set up just so I can sort of show you what it's like. But you can see how much noise came out of that, right? There was quite a bit. I didn't go as, as much as I could, but it, quite a bit came out. And then you can sharpen that up and you get a lot better image, right? Now, one of the things here that's important is if you notice these eggs, right? They're not very bright. So one of the things I wanna do here and you can do this easily enough, is give myself a brush, highlight these a little bit, and then give them a little bit more saturation. So that as you're, you can make the, the blue pop. Come on, come up there blue. You don't wanna to go too far, but as you can see, the, the blue will come up. And then of course, crop it <clears> through <throat> your post vignetting but you want to make sure that those pop in and, and go back and knock down some of these bright spots. Again, you can do the subject selection and soften out the, the background a little bit. So those are the things to think about. Um, one of the things I do want to show you on this, that's kind of nice. If I do a subject selection, notice it just gets these guys, right? What I really want to do is I want to add and make sure I get the eggs in here too. So I can use my brush and add additional pieces to that subject selection, and then go up here and invert it. And then um, take down the, um, <clears throat> the sharpness a little bit. So there's different things you can do here, but with the, um, the brush, even if you do a subject selection, you can go back and add and, and delete from that pretty easy with, sub, with the brush, right? Yeah, 
You say here, add or subtract. This add subtract right here, and you tell it which one you how you want to do it. You can you can select it different ways. Use a brush, use different things, but you can add and select and subtract. The the question for the folks on the phone was how do I find the denoise and Lightroom versus Topaz? Uh, the denoise Topaz has a lot of different models you can choose from. So you can say, okay, I want it, it maybe it's very noisy um, and, and it's soft or out of focus or whatever, but there's different models you can choose from that you don't have in Lightroom. And what I tend to do is go look at the different models and see which one gives me the best result, and then I use it. So that's the main advantage to using um, Topaz over Lightroom. A bird on a nest with chicks, right? This, this is always fun in the April, May time frame. Um, look for parents, chicks are active. Feeding time is best. Morning is usually the best. You guys don't make fun of me out there in the room. Um, look for the chicks are active and find an angle where you can see both the parents and chicks faces. Because a lot of times you'll see one or the other. Try to get all their faces in there. Uh, you may need a little more depth of field. And uh, feeding happens fast, so you may want to use your multi-shot feature because if things are going really fast, you might want to have a burst or two in there. And expect quite a few throwaways on these because I've got lots of chicks that, in these chick pictures that just don't ever work out. Post-processing, right? Um, I, don't, I don't think there's anything... Uh, that I had in here that talks about that I haven't shown you already. Uh, but the, the big thing is, as you're doing subject selection, that's, this is with the chicks, that's really where that add and subtract with the brush helps. Because those, you can get in tight on these things, you can add and subtract those things. That makes a big difference because it, a lot of times when you get down in the bottom where their legs and things are, and there's foreground clutter, it doesn't do as good a job of selection. So that's where you might need that. Chronicle a nest throughout the year. I'm going to shoot. Yes, go ahead. Uh, depth of field, right? Yeah. Is the, the closest. Oh, 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 oh. Um, I'd have to look. Usually I'm in. Uh, I'm and these kind of things I'm shooting um, probably five six or so is is about what I'm shooting I think. A lot of it has to depend on how long my lens is and how far away I am right because if I'm fairly close I might I might need to open it up a little bit or, or whatever so I don't have to get a little, as much depth of field. So nesting and mating. Um, Watch, I was able to catch this, these tricolors uh, at the very beginning. This is where they actually were building the nest and they ended up mating when I was there. And I'm thinking, I'm coming back to see what happens. The next thing I can is the one I just showed you. Here they are with their eggs that, that with, with, with the group. And then here they are with the chicks. Tricolor chicks are not very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually, yeah, only a mother could love these images. But as you can see, it's kind of fun. I remember where they were. Uh, Jerry, I'm sorry. I'm just stunned that you actually remembered where they were. Okay. Uh, well, Helen say she's stunned that I remembered where they were. That's, I, well, you know, you can still see the Sharpie on the, on the railing when you go there. Um, <laughs> but no, I just. I just, I remembered that and I thought to myself, it's, it was a relatively easy spot to remember where it was. So I just went back to it each time. But this is fun. If you really think about, if you're gonna go multiple times and do it, try to chronicle some of these, right? All right, any questions on birds on a nest? We're actually doing pretty good on time. So we're in good shape. All right, let's go to birds in flight. This is probably, the hardest thing to do. 
Any of you have tried it? I have thousands of birds that didn't work. Um, I would recommend if you have two bodies and for you doing birds in flight, you take them both and have a couple different lenses on it. Jim Brady and I went the other day and I was, I had a, 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 long, a long and a longer lens. And uh, I was using some of those for farther away because sometimes what happens is the birds will fly off into a fairly distant location to get a branch. And you'll see them out there getting that branch and then they start to bring it back. And if you wanna capture them as they're taking off out there in, in the distance, you need a longer lens. But if you're painting and getting them up close as they're coming by, you don't need as long a lens. The other thing about that is, um, you know, opening up or closing your lenses and trying to find it and get the right, um, the right aperture openings and things is difficult. So if you have two, two different bodies, I was constantly swapping back and forth. <clears throat> I would recommend if you don't have a high speed card for your camera, you get one. Because if you're going to turn on high, sheet, high speed shutter mode, as these birds are flying and try to take pictures, it's going to fill up pretty quick and it will slow down and it will stop taking pictures. So if you're going to shoot burst 20 or 30 shots in a flight, it, it can slow down. So get, get a high speed card. Um, somewhere in the 200 to 800 range is typically what I use. A, a lot of times I'll be taking these shots at six to 700 millimeter uh, equivalents. And then the other thing you want to do is figure out which way the wind's blowing because birds will take off and land into the wind typically. And so if you can say, okay, the wind path is this way, that means when they come in, they're going to circle around the back and, and land that way. You'll, you'll see that happening. You can figure that out. Or if they take off, they're going to take off into that wind. So you want to kind of understand which way the wind's blowing. So as you prep yourself and take off and landing, you know where, which way they're going to go. Um, I'm going to show you how to do this. If you're going to be taking a, a, a bunch of birds in flight, you want to get a 90 degree angle to the path of flight. You don't want to be looking at a bird coming at you or going away, because that's the hardest for your camera to focus. So you want to try to position yourself where you can get a 90 degree angle to the bird to the flight. That way your focus is going to stay more consistent. Um, your F-stop, you want a medium depth of field, but you're also going to need at least a 15, one 15 thousandths or a 2,000th or higher for birds in flight. Your bigger birds, the great egrets, the wood storks, and the uh, rosettas are slower birds. They don't need quite as fast, but if you're gonna shoot a snowy or a cattle egret, you're gonna have to have a fast shutter speed. Those guys go quick, right? Um, <clears throat> and the mornings are best because the birds are more active. They're out getting the different branches and stuff. So here, what I typically try to do is if you see that boardwalk, a lot of the birds fly back and forth from the trees out to beyond the alligator farm and then back. I try to position myself on the boardwalk so that as I, I see them going back and forth, I can follow them out there. Now, you, you can't be so far back that you can't see them coming, but you can't be too far forward that they're always going over your head. So it takes a little bit of practice to know where to stand. Practice, when you're, when you're starting off on this, it's hard to get going because you'll try to take, you try to put the, the camera on the bird and then hit it and then not move the camera. You need to really learn how to pan with the birds. Start with taking off and landing. Those are relatively short things to do. You can see them get ready to take off and start to pan with them, right? Start to pan with them as they're taking off. Uh, like I said, the bigger birds are slower. Start with them first. The wood storks are, are pretty easy to capture because they don't fly very fast, but they're pretty ugly. <laughs> no, I do. I don't use a tripod when birds in flight. You have to pan with it, so you just can't. Now, some people use tripods um, 
for like birds on the nest and that type of thing, it's actually a good idea if you're going to take some of those, to, especially if you want to, if it's pretty dark in the shade, you can have much longer shutter speed on a tripod. So that is something you may want to consider. Yes. The question is image stabilization uh, at this speed. I, um, I try to take, turn it off. But I just don't, I don't always remember to, but if you're, if you're doing this kind of back and forth and trying to pan with the bird, it's better not to have it on. But if you're, if you're taking a picture of birds that, you know, stay, then yes. Um, <clears throat> start by taking the pictures in a wider zoom. And then as you get better panning with it, um, zoom in on it. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice in many cases is there's a bird. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I've learned to keep both my eyes open. So as I'm looking through the viewfinder, I've also got my other eye open so I can kind of see where it is in relationship to the end of the, of the lens and I move it. I've learned that over time. Um, so you might want to consider keeping both, try that, keep both eyes open so that you can see where the bird is and then reposition your lens to make sure it's in the frame. Yes. I, I have both on my, I use Olympus, it does both, um, but uh, it, it only goes like 20 frames a second mechanical. If you wanna go faster than that, you can, you can go up to like, I think 60 frames a second, but it's electronic, but you also fill up your buffer really fast. So I typically find that 15 to 20 frames a second is fast enough. Oh, make sure you turn on your continuous autofocus with tracking, because if you don't, you're only going to get one image out of it. So continuous autofocus with tracking. And if you have the AI on your subject recognition, make sure it's turned on. Post-processing. One of the things that is interesting is you get a lot of birds that aren't quite in the frame where you want it. And you say, oh man, I wish I had more space at the bottom or the top or whatever. Let me show you what I did with this one. This is not necessarily the best picture, but it was an interesting one for what I wanted to do from a post-processing discussion. All right. Okay, where are you? Okay, here it is. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a couple of different shots. First of all, uh, I, I did sharpen this one up first, but then I went and this is a sharpened one. And as you notice, I don't have much space in the bottom or on the right. So I wanna open that up. So first thing I would do is I'll go in here and I'll crop it somewhat. Just so I don't have quite as much to work with when I'm in. Photoshop. And then I'll do a photo editing. Photoshop. Now, what we're going to do in, in Photoshop is manipulate the canvas size. It is not the image size, it's the canvas size. So I'll go in here and I'll do image, respond to me, canvas size. And if you notice here, what it's done is it gives me this little thing says, which way do you want to expand it? Well, I'm going to click it up here and say, I want to only go to the right and the bottom. And for the width, I'll take this to 18 inches. Oops. And I didn't add, didn't do both of them. For the bot, for the height, I want to go to four, uh, let's go to 15. And as you see now, I've got space on either side. Well, I just take this rectangular selection tool right here. And 
and I'll do a content aware fill. Fill, content, content aware. There you go. You got some there on the bottom. It didn't quite get as much as I wanted, but I've got some. I'll go a little bit more. And then on the right side, As you can see, it doesn't do a bad job. I don't know why it's not really doing too much here on the bottom. Let me try one more time on the bottom. And now you have a lot, a lot more room to crop. So you can go back and you can crop this a little bit differently. Maybe we'll come back over here, put about this corner up here, whatever, put them bottom thirds. So you can, and you can spend some time cleaning up that, uh, those images a little bit. You can go in and um, do some softening or whatever those images so they you know, they look a bit a little bit more natural but content aware fill is your friend in these situations as you want to expand your frame to get a better crop jerry yes what is the difference between canvas size and image size the question on the phone is what's the difference between canvas image size and canvas size if you said, I wanted to expand your image size, your total image would get bigger. If you say you want to expand your canvas, it takes and expands the background that the image is on. It doesn't expand the image itself. That way it allows you, it gives you more space to edit in. Even though you nothing in it, it gives you more space to edit in. So really, oh, yeah. like, you know, I take a bigger canvas, but I put the same size picture on it. Or I say, I have a bigger canvas, I want a big, and I want to fill it with the picture. That's the difference. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Some of the tips, look for some images. I mean, look at all your images. Like for this one, I, I had no clue. As I started to take a look at it, I saw this image, I thought, oh, wow, there's a shadow on the wing there. <clears throat> and it came out, <clears throat> and I've cropped it a little different ways. One of my favorite ways to crop this is to just crop just the head and the wing and just have the head and the wing with that image on it. So there's a lot of different ways to crop it to get some different perspectives, but look closer at your pictures. Sometimes you're gonna have something there you didn't see when you took the picture. And, and another thing to do is go back and see where your focal point is. Most uh, you can either do it on the back of your camera. It'll show you, most places will show you your, your focal point. But also in this particular case, I have the software from the uh, manufacturer, the OM workspace. And in it, you could say, show me my focus point on this image. So you can go back and take a look at these pictures and say, was I getting the right focus point or not? And the best way to do it really is on the back of the camera to see where it's focusing, if it's really getting the right focus or not. But that's where you want to do it. <clears throat> but make sure you got your focus. Again, with your bright, with a bright blue sky, you can do a replacement to make it more dramatic. These birds in flight sometimes they're pretty, they're just white bird on a blue background, right? Well, sometimes it's nice to kind of do something different just to make it more dramatic. If you really want to get tricky, try to get a bird in flight with bokeh. When you're doing this, you have to get the right depth of field. So you actually have to have a lower f-stop and <clears throat> have fast shutter speed and follow these things right along. So uh, 
always birds in the sky are not always what you want to get. Sometimes that green background can really make the birds pop. And so the green background for the great uh, egrets is really one of the better ones. The Rosetta spoonbills come out nice in there. I've never got a green background with a um, wood stork. They're just always up there in the tops of the trees. <clears throat> As you're practicing, you want to take a look at one of your uh, higher speed, one of your longer series of shots, right? You want to take a look at it and see how well you did in terms of panning with the bird. So here's what I did just to show you what, what that can look like. So this, I think there's a series of about 17 shots here that I took on this particular bird taken off the nest. As you can see, I didn't keep them in the frame the whole time or centered in the frame, but I kept him in the frame for most of the time. Even when he went behind the bush, I kept him there. So see, see what you can do in, in that case, just to see how, how good you're doing to keep, the, keep um, focused on keeping the bird in there and practice on that. Yes, Bill. And the question was, do I use the pro-capture mode of the Olympus? <clears throat> and the answer is <clears throat> no, uh, not for this, I don't. Um, if for If I'm at Huguenot with the chicks on the beach and they're coming in really fast, I do. But for just birds in flight, I don't use the pro-capture mode. For the, fo for the folks that don't know what a pro-capture mode is, on the Olympus, you can push down the butt <clears> on <throat> the shutter <clears throat> on the, and it will start filling the buffer. <clears throat> but it won't write anything to the disc until you push it all the way down. And then she takes like the last 20 or 30 frames and, and copies it in there. But that way you can keep it down for a minute or two and you won't have 2000 pictures. You only have the last, what was in your buffer when, when you push the button. Yes. What's the first uh, photograph you chose? The, the wing chest, the right Okay, that's an actually a good question. <clears throat> Believe it or not, <clears throat> in many cases, um, I've had, I've fixed that with content aware film. I, I've actually taken that type of image. I don't know that I've got that one here to try it. Let me look and see if I do or not. Well, here, let's just do this, right? So let's take this guy and crop it. That's what you're talking about, right? All right. So let's go in and do a photo, edit in Photoshop. Great question, thank you. Oh, the, the question was, how do you deal with the online for the folks in here, was how do you deal with uh, where you've cropped off the end of the, of the wing? And so I did it here, right? And again, if you do this uh, image, excuse me, edit canvas size or image canvas size and expand that side there, make the width 17 inches. Let's go pretty wide, all right? And then I can go back here, do this content aware fill. Voila. Not bad, huh? So yeah, you can, I've done that. And if I don't like the way it is, some what I've done before, if I don't really like it, I maybe use a clone brush and I'll add a clone brush. I'll take a, a feather near it or whatever and bring it out a little bit farther. But that's typically what I do if I've cropped the edge of the wing off. No problem. I'm gonna sit now. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, 
Other shots. Uh, not too far. Of course, there's gators there, right? I encourage you to take shots, gators, and other things that are there. <clears throat> if you haven't, if you only go to the rookery, you're going to miss a lot of different things. I encourage you, if you're going there, after you do some shots of the rookery, walk the rest of the alligator farm. There are lots of alligators, crocodiles, all sorts of different animals in there, birds, all sorts of different things that are interesting to take a picture of. Tortoises, you name it, they're there. Uh, I definitely recommend walking the rest of the alligator farm. There's lots of reflections, right? All the ponds all the way around there, there's lots of reflections that happen. What you wanna do is make sure that you have the chance to go through and take a look at all the different reflections and get them. Um, <clears throat> I have thousands and thousands of reflection shots that work sometimes, that don't work, um, but you know, do take some time and do that. And you can do, uh, different color or different birds together. So I've had the rosettas and the great egrets and uh, all the different types of birds together. Headshots, right? One of the things that's interesting, especially as you get close on the nest, is there's lots of head, different headshots that you can take. Um, I've got two different rosettas here. One of the interesting things about them is their ears, right? They, they have these little things there that their ears and i didn't notice it until i really got close on these things took shots but there are headshots you can take um and you can do all the different birds uh, i like the tricolors the um the different um that are the different snowies and different things always have some interesting headshots you can always do humorous shots right there's all sorts of different things that happen there's um, you have the vultures that are there. They're, they're usually, as you go, the vultures are usually sitting on the fence about two thirds of the way down the boardwalk on the left. I don't know why they like it there. They just sit there and they're pretty interesting to take pictures of. Uh, if you haven't taken pictures of them, just to do something different. Uh, I violated my rule of thirds here. I mean, my um, rule of uh, odds. There were three here, but I like the picture of the two of them better because they look like they're interacting together. And of course, there's lots of squirrels and other animals and things there. The other thing that you can do, and I encourage you to do this, is video. Pick video. <laughs> there, yeah, accidental, accidental feedings happen every once in a while. Um, you don't use a capture. Them. I never captured one on, on a camera yet, but uh, they, they, you can watch them and every once in a while they will happen. You can take a look at and watch the alligators, especially when they're waiting out on the, on the platform down there. The gators will try to stalk the birds in the water. So it's kind of interesting to watch them do that. So. You know, take some time to do that. All right, that's it. Any comments or questions? Question. Okay, uh huh. Okay, so one of the things, the question is, what kind of um, focus grid do you use? I typically tend to be center focused, uh, maybe a medium grid, but I also have my um, subject recognition turned on. And sometimes you need to expand that a little bit farther, depending on where the subject is to make sure it finds it, gets it. But usually it's uh, center focused, just a, about a nine to 
nine point nine point yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so the question was, if you have a picture in Lightroom that, that you like, you think is going to be good, can you make a copy of it? The answer is yes. You just create this, you right click it and say this create virtual copy. And now you've got two. Control what? Control, control apostrophe will also do it. Yeah. It puts it in the film strip. So if you look here, right? If I go back at the film strip, I just made a copy of that. It is a virtual copy. Right, or... So... Just a comment on the way that Lightroom works. The Lightroom does not actually touch the underlying image. It keeps the edits in the catalog and it keeps the underlying image there. If you create a virtual image, all you're doing is creating a second set of edits to that same image, right? Now, when you do an export, you can export one or the other and get what you want and it will make the, however you want it to export as, as Jim was saying. I mean, Jeff was saying, sorry. So, I mean, you can do that, fine. But um, <clears throat> it won't, if you really want it and you just want to make a separate copy of it to do that, virtual copies are fine. The other thing you can do is if you say edit in Photoshop and bring it back, it creates a TIFF file typically when you when you have, so you have a second photo that's actual a separate image. Yes. So the question was, if I go have thousands of images, how do I get to the ones I want, right? I keep all my images. And what I do is I go through the first time through and I rank them. So I use the ranking star. Um, then I'll go back and I'll edit and update those images after I've ranked them. Uh, and then I'll take the last so many, and then I look and see what I have uh, duplicates of if I have this too many of this or that I'll try to then uh, rank it to either one to five stars and then pick the, the top five the five stars and export those that's typically what I do um, what I have found and the reason I don't get rid of things is with the new software like Topaz and Sharpen and all the new stuff that's coming out. I've gone back and taken images that I took 15 years ago that I didn't think were any good and actually made something of them. So uh, storage is cheap. I just keep them. I, I don't typically keep what they call the sidecar images. So if you take a RAW and a JPEG together in your, in, when you're photographing, which I do, uh, and you download those, it downloads them both in Lightroom. It always copy, it always edits the raw and keeps the JPEG as a, what they call a sidecar. I've got a routine that I get rid of those once I've done that. And the, really the only reason I, I shoot the JPEGs at all is because when I download them to my phone to look at them, uh, I have a link between my phone and the, and the camera. The raws are just too big and take too long. I can just take a look at the JPEG real quick and see which ones I like on my on my phone before I get home to edit them. Any questions online? Yes. Which ones do you store do you like? Um, I take the micro SD and then I use the the class two, whatever it is. I, uh, but I use um UHS too, but the, the brand I use is the, what's the main big brand? I'm sorry? SanDisk. I usually use the SanDisk Extremes. 
Are there any questions online? All right, then we'll call it a wrap. Thanks, everybody. If everybody could help us out by um, taking, are we gonna, do we need to pull those out, Liz, or how do we stack those? Good.